today I'm going to talk to you about boundaries, communities, and things that can kill us all. Boundaries and communities shape our responses to catastrophes, including those that can kill us all. We regularly see disasters unfolding in the news, and we hear of deaths and large-scale suffering on a daily basis. But we could, and most likely will, face far worse disasters than these. There are risks that threaten humanity's existence as a whole. I work for the Centre for the Study of Existential Risk in Cambridge, with one of a small number of research groups worldwide that focus on understanding existential risks, those threats to humanity's survival, and what might be done to manage them. Some sources of existential risk may only be familiar from disaster movies. They may appear to have little to do with real life, or at least seem very remote and unlikely. But these are not just fictional scenarios. Examples include extreme risks of natural origin, such as asteroid strikes, solar storms, supervolcanic eruptions, and pandemic disease outbreaks. As well as these natural risks, which humanity has always faced, we have created new sources of risk over the last couple of centuries. For instance, climate change, nuclear winter, and misuse of or mistakes with advanced technologies, such as biotechnologies and artificial intelligence. With some of these risks, reaching the level of wiping out humanity may be unlikely, but it is not impossible. Humanity has faced such risks in the past, and our vulnerability to them is increasing. What do I mean when I say our vulnerability is increasing? Surely we have much better capacity to identify and respond to such risks than in the past. We can take a particular historic scenario involving a community's reaction to an extreme risk to explore how vulnerability has changed. This image is of the gates of a school in Eme, a small village in the Peak District. In 1665, with an outbreak already underway in London, transport of cloth from the capital introduced plague to the village. On noticing the first case, the community responded by quarantining itself for over a year. No one was allowed to enter or leave the village in order to prevent spread of the disease to other local communities. Even at this time, such actions were possible in small, isolated communities, but not in larger urban areas. We are far more connected today. Our populations are much larger and mostly concentrated in large towns and cities. Attempting to isolate ourselves as an existential catastrophe unfolds will be futile and probably counterproductive. More than this, the systems we depend on are also deeply connected globally. These include communications, transport and trade, financial systems, and our food and energy supply networks. These high levels of connectivity bring many benefits in daily life, but they also create deep vulnerabilities. A catastrophic event impacting one part of a system can rapidly spread through that system and to other systems as well. A severe solar storm, for example, would knock out power grids for several weeks and leave millions of people without electricity for months. It would have cascading impacts on global communications, transport, healthcare, food distribution, and so on. It would also put severe strain on our social and political systems. We have no easy way of setting boundaries on this connectedness. No easy way of putting barriers in place to prevent an initial event from spreading through multiple systems. This means we are more likely to see existential risks from multiple catastrophes in combination rather than from a single event. Our deep global connections are why it is valuable to consider both boundaries and communities in how we respond to existential risks. Focusing on one particular type of risk can help us to explore this further, and I'm going to focus on pandemic disease threats. Pandemics are a type of extreme risk where the initial event, the disease outbreak, is unlikely to wipe out humanity, but its knock-on impacts on society may be very severe, making recovery difficult and massively increasing our vulnerability to further disasters. The risks of pandemic disease are not far-fetched. We have faced them before and will again, likely in the relatively near future. What have we faced before? This includes major outbreaks of plague and influenza, such as the Black Death and the Great Plague of London, which killed high proportions of the population, 
and the Spanish influenza outbreak of 1918 to 1919, which killed more than 50 million people worldwide. And what is the threat now? The disease outbreak that's received most attention in recent years is Ebola, and epidemics of cholera and plague are currently in the news. But these are not the most serious threats that we face. The most likely extreme disease threat is an influenza pandemic. A severe pandemic is expected to cause more than 100 million deaths worldwide, and between 200,000 and 300,000 deaths in the UK. To put that in context, the total number of deaths in England and Wales in 2016 was just over 525,000. A pandemic influenza outbreak is high probability. Indeed, it is viewed as inevitable. In assessing risks to national security over the next five years, the UK government ranks pandemic influenza as highest in both probability and severity. Here we can see how it's ranked against, for example, flooding and extreme weather events. If we go back to the story of Eam, the ideas of both boundaries and communities feature in the village's reactions to the plague. Both physical and moral boundaries were used to control the outbreak. Physical barriers were established to prevent movement of people, and these were backed up with moral force as the community sought to avoid spread of the disease to other villages at a cost of considerable hardship and likely higher loss of life within Eam. Setting up barriers is a frequent reaction to catastrophic events and humanitarian crises. Think of the barriers Europe put in place in the face of large flows of refugees. For disease outbreaks in particular, use of some physical measures may make sense for containing outbreaks. But we need to be careful about such reactions, particularly in the face of existential risks. Our practical ability to isolate ourselves from what is happening in the rest of the world is extremely limited. As I pointed out earlier, we rely on international systems for food and energy, communications, and so on. We will also need high levels of cooperation between countries to successfully address catastrophes as they unfold and prevent them overwhelming us all. Attempting to isolate ourselves and protect our own interests first will erode the trust that's vital for such cooperation. Such actions will also be morally problematic. For most of us, it is already difficult to ignore widespread suffering in the world and leave it unaddressed. Even with multiple disasters around us now, we are far short of the suffering we could see as such a pandemic played out. And while the impacts in the UK could be devastating, we are still in a much better position than most of the world will be. It has been projected that in a pandemic of similar severity to the 1918 influenza, 96% of deaths will be in the developing world. We already give moral consideration to people in other countries. The nature of existential risks and the responses most likely to get us through them should simply amplify these moral concerns. We should shift both our physical and moral boundaries to the level of humanity. Physical boundaries have no practical relevance in the face of existential risks. And a shift in moral boundaries may be key to our collective survival following a globally catastrophic event. At one level, then, we should consider ourselves to be a global community. However, there are good reasons to focus on the local level, too. What you do locally can make a difference. Again, taking pandemic influenza as an example, societal responses will have significant influence on the course of an outbreak, on the effectiveness of response efforts, and on recovery. So what sort of effects would a pandemic have locally? Recent experience may lead us to feel unconcerned. The most recent pandemic influenza outbreak, the swine flu in 2009, was mild compared to others, with around 450 deaths in the UK. But infection and death rates are expected to be far higher in a future outbreak. Government advice to local authorities is to prepare for between 200,000 and 315,000 extra deaths over a 15-week period during a future pandemic so we can expect something much more socially disruptive. There are things we can all do to be better prepared for the social impacts of a pandemic, which will play out at a local level. An important first step is for communities to work out how to handle the practical and psychological impacts and to build knowledge about local needs and resources. 
This could include working out how we might best respond to particular scenarios. For example, how would local businesses and services cope without a third of their workforce? Worker absence will be particularly problematic in key sectors like healthcare, social services, and energy supply. Our communities will be better able to respond to such a scenario if we have worked out in advance how we might support key sectors. For example, we could identify people with relevant skills and experience who could step in at times of high worker absence, and we could train volunteer support workers. A related example is to work out how the community might be affected if schools or public transport had to shut down. How many more people would be unable to work? Are there ways in which the community could organise childcare and shared transport to minimise disruption? And how might the community support those who, for example, will struggle to afford food without an income for a few weeks? It is not only these sorts of practical impacts that community activities can help to address. Building local awareness in advance may also help with acceptance of extraordinary measures needed to cope with the increased number of deaths and the psychological impacts of this. Death rates are expected to be between two and five times higher during the pandemic period. This will be distressing in itself, but will be compounded by the fact that mortuary capacities will be severely stretched and that standard practices for funerals, burials and cremations cannot be followed. Only finding out as a crisis unfolds that you cannot give your loved ones a traditional funeral service or that a local community building needs to be used as a temporary mortuary will likely be far more upsetting than if you had been informed about the likelihood and justifications for such actions in advance and if the community had been able to consider options together. But currently, I think these are things that we mostly just have no awareness of. Such local community activities imply a sense of boundaries again, and we should be careful about who may be overlooked or excluded in such a process. It will also be useful for local communities to form networks amongst themselves and share experience and resources. These ideas about building local awareness and planning for catastrophes in advance will be really valuable for our responses to other disasters. Simply knowing about the resources, knowledge and experience available in your neighbourhood and having an idea of local support needs will more generally contribute to community resilience to disasters. Many people willingly volunteer when a crisis hits and I hope we're among them. Our contributions will be more effective when coordinated at a community level and planned in advance. The range and complexity of extreme risks that humanity currently faces can, with justification, seem overwhelming and inescapable. Risks at this scale should strengthen our sense of global community where physical and moral boundaries between people become irrelevant, while at the same time encouraging local community efforts as an essential first level of response. Separating out different sources of risk and different levels of response can make it easier to understand how we might address them. There are things we can do, and these things are worth doing. Rather than not knowing about these risks and therefore being unable to do anything to address them, it is better to know and to make efforts to respond. Thank you.